let's just, and I, I won't do this justice, I admit, uh, if you want futurist teachings, run to your local bookstore and you can run out with cases of them because it's all the same old stuff. It is Ribera's theology and don't let them fool you. But we need to, you know, we need to just basically examine this. I'm not going to throw up any charts for you or anything right now. They're out there. You can go to Clarence Larkin's books and get the charts. I mean, they're out there a dime a dozen. All right? And there are also a lot of good charts out there, too, that help guide you through historical, linear perspective. And that helps bring things together for you. you know, see, this is so important because it, this is imperative because an entire systematic theology is going to crumble. I'm going after not only the, the you know, we're tearing down a billion dollar book industry. It needs to come down. Because it's, it's manipulating and, and it is creating mass confusion, creating the terrible source of, in, of, in, of uncertainty. It's turning ministers into buffoons. It really is. And it's, it's, it's time we get angry about it and we deal with it. I believe this uh, whole systematic theology is going to crumble before your eyes when we read the true interpretation of Daniel 9. You know, I, like I said, I'm, <laughs> there's a lot of theories around futurism. There's a lot of in-house variations. Uh, I'm not going to deal with all that. I, I don't, I'm quite frankly sick of looking at it, sick of reading it, sick of... Uh, it's, it, but it's all the same old foundations. Now, so throughout the first 69 prophetical weeks of the prophecy, and we'll talk about that. Many of the futurists and the historicists and even the, the Roman theologi theologians have, have agreed. And we accurately date the beginning of the, week in the, of the weeks in the year 457 B.C. And ending the 69th week, which is after literally 483 literal years in A.D. 27. Now, while I'm talking about this, if you happen to have a copy of, this, of the 70 weeks on, and it might be coming up on the screen, but on page 80 is, is you can follow right along as we go through the 70 weeks, a chart of linear historical perspective. It's not a chart of cartoons and, and all that neat stuff. It is the history of what has happened and how accurately each item or segmentation of the prophecy was fulfilled in history. So we end in 27 AD with the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, which is appearing, the appearing of Messiah the Prince. Let me insert here, you know, a brief orientation concerning the dating of Christ's birth. Now we need to kind of talk about that. Uh, I don't want to go deep there. Um, I'm going to reference you to a, a, a neat writing. I mean, not a neat writing, but a good uh, summation in the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. Uh, I used the fifth improved edition, page 1,655. Because you're, you might not be f familiar with, well, gosh, wasn't Jesus born in, in, in zero, and there is no zero in the calculations? Where are we getting the 4 B.C. from? And, this, this, this is not that hard to understand. Thompson went on to, to write, The Romans, who were the dominating power when Jesus was born, generally dated all events from the foundation of Rome. Anno Urbis I. In the 6th century, the Pope determined to have a new calendar prepared which would date all events from the birth of Jesus. Now, right there, remember what Daniel said that the little horn would what? Think to change times and laws? Daniel 9, excuse me, Daniel 7 and 25. He commissioned a monk, Dionysus, to do the work. This calendar, when finished, was gradually adopted through Christendom. And modern scholars had found that some of the dates of Roman history near the beginning of the Christian era cannot, I said cannot, be reconciled with this Roman calendar. For example, according to the Roman annals, 
Herod the Great, who ruled Judea when Jesus was born, he died in the year 750 Anno Urbis. The Roman calendar placed him, placed the birth of Jesus in the year 754 Anno Urbis. In an apparent contradiction of the well established dates of the Roman records, and they were very accurate. Jesus was probably born in the year 749 or 750 Anno Urbis. That is four or five years earlier that the date is given in our commonly accepted calendar. Hence, in modern literature, scholars refer to Christmas, oh boy, as 4 or 5 BC, most heavenly, <coughs> lean heavily to 4 BC. <clears throat> Excuse me, I agree with this conclusion. And that is pretty well established in. in, in in the scholastic world of the birth of Christ for B.C. because of the disparity between the Roman calendar and the papal calendar. Now some futurists like to, to date the decree which uh, commenced the time measure a little later and trying to bring, bring us down to the conclusion of the 483 years to 30 A.D. in the crucifixion of Jesus. See, they know that the crucifixion is involved in this prophecy. Messiah is cut off. This presents, <laughs> this is a great problem for them, but they don't tell you that. They're hoping you don't pick up on it. They just simply take liberty with established and tried historical dates, and so they make their excuse for Iberia's scheme try to fit. So, again, we're talking about the futurist interpretation. After that 69th week, they say the clock stops. Final week is separated in the future, and they have now broken a time measure. That they often refer to this as their parenthesis, parenthesis theory. The Antichrist does not appear until this time, which is their great tribulation. I know you've all heard these terms. Not only do they put Antichrist exclusively in the future, they try to even tell us that the seals, trumpets, and vials they're all going to transpire very swiftly, all these very intricate, fabulous prophecies are just going to flippantly pop through in a seven-year period. It gets pretty absurd when you think about it, doesn't it? Why would Jesus reveal Himself only to the last prophetic week of this age? Why? It is His revelation. The, the Reformers, they had no right to understand measures of revelation. The Great Awakening Fathers, they had no... Yeah, we could go on and on. Nothing was given to them. Then they try to tell us that those who are left on this earth after the rapture, oh, they're the ones that are going to interpret this stuff and understand what happens to them. But this is not what Daniel taught. Daniel was clear. He stated, none of the wicked shall understand. Finally, they teach a tribulation and wrath are added to the 70th week. And some teach three and a half years is tribulation, second half of this period of wrath, and then you have the rapture of the church. And by the, I, I really don't know how much I'm going to go into that because it is such theological buffoonery. I don't, I, don't, I don't know how much. And we have dealt with it in other shows, and there's tons of material in truth and history. Uh, a great book here by uh, Colonel Speed Wilson. Rapture, a dangerous deception. I knew him personally. Uh, they on and on McPherson's works. They're, they're out there. Read them, okay? So you have raptures. So this, see, we have folks called pre-tribulationists. These are the one that put the rapture supposed at the beginning of the week. Post-tribulationists put the rapture at the end of the week. And some put it in the mid, middle of the week, midweekers. Re regardless of all these rapture theories, what do they do? They all revolve around the 70th week of Daniel being in the future. This te the teachers of, of what I, I'm going to call this Roman theology are, are legion out there now. I used to have the word numerous. They're legion. They're just... just it, it, uh, Pastor Jennings and I often... Uh, just look at each other and say, we try to explain this wave and it's just, just like a spell is coming over the, come over the church, over the kingdom of God. 
over Christ's true Israel. Now, it'll make things worse. <laughs> here's, here's just a little glimpse in some perplexing scenarios uh, pertaining to their in-time individual antichrist. Some said he's going to be a, a political leader arising out of the common market or Syria. Well, remember John already refuted this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, where he talks about coming out from among us. This perdition, all this that the apostles have made it clear this is an apostolic apostasy. He signs a peace treaty with Israel. They don't even know who the true Israel is. They think these so-called Jews over on the white rocks in Palestine are the fulfillment of prophecy in God's Israel. There is endless material here at Truth and History that will answer those issues for you and educate you and if you have the courage to pursue it, when you're done, you'll be able to look at your brother in the eye and say, my Bible makes sense now. Now I understand why Jesus said he only came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and why he had the nerve to call Sumerians dogs. Yes, you're Jesus in your Bible. Third point. <laughs> when the Russians invade natural Israel, their interpretations of Ezekiel which meaning that little, and their interpretation of natural Israel is, is that group on the pile of white rocks in the Middle East, is the fulfillment of uh, Joel chapters 2 and 3, Zechariah 11, 12, and, and then what the, the gall, even though those prophecies, and we're not even going to touch them in this seminar, have very, very uh, powerful implications, I believe, yet to come because of the, their context with events later in the book of Revelation. But they say that it's Antichrist who's going to defeat them. Read their books. It's, it's absurd. You walk away scratching your head. You're going, but what? <laughs> you know, God clearly is the one who defeats in these struggles and in these prophetic upheavals and, earth, uh, and earthquakes and judgments on kingdoms. It's, it's Christ. It's not Antichrist. So, you know, in a nutshell, that's, and, I, and I, I do admit, I did not do justice to it, but I don't have to. Go read their own words. Now, right before we go in, and we're going to unveil the 70 weeks, and we're going to start right with the six Messianic prophecies, why is this so important? Why did I research for 10 years and other men much longer than that and, and write our volleys and fire our, our theological shots? Why did I, I and Brother Campbell and the others all understand that we have got to get this 70 weeks right because once we do, everything will change in the futurist camp. The preterists, they still have to be dealt with on the year day and history. And try to justify to you why they teach Alcazarian theology. So why are the 70 weeks so important? I list them and I list these challenges in my book. First, the 70 weeks is one of the greatest messianic prophecies recorded in the Bible. With its understanding, the exact year that Messiah the Prince or Jesus Christ began his public ministry. Confirming the new covenant with the Judeans, the Jews, all this stuff that is not properly interpreted, but with that group for seven years. See, this would be known. Thus, proving that Jesus was Israel's predicted Messiah. That's why modern day Talmudic Judaism does not want you to calculate the times. Their prophet Daniel already proved that Jesus was their redeemer and they saw him and they knew him not and they killed him. Secondly, the futuristic school, which is also a school of dispensationalism, and I know I haven't really defined dispensationalism and how, how these things mesh, how dispensationalism and futurism ride each other, one dealing more with Antichrist and prophecies and one dealing more with all this uh, focus on modern, quote, Israel and Jewry. 
but it, they will unfold over time in this seminar. But the futuristic school or dispensationalism of Bible prophecy totally depends on Ribera's interpretation of Daniel chapter 9. See, if the truth of the time measures taught, this whole school of, deceptive, of deception will come crumbling down at our feet. No longer will kingdom and restorational teachings be hindered by the escapist and defeatist mentality of these futurists and dispensationalists. We're going to have a great breach repaired, but we got like Jeremiah said in chapter 1 verse 10, we've got to tear it down. We have got to have the courage to confront it and tear it down, no matter what the cost. Thirdly, once futurism is sent back to the pit from where it originated, we can properly interpret the revelation of Jesus Christ. I do not believe that the New Testament revolves exclusively around a two-generation church. I think that concept is absurd. There have been two millenniums of life and death struggle in Christendom between these periods. And don't tell me our Lord had nothing to say about it or say to these saints, many know better and in this seminar we will prove that he had much to say to his people.